Our guest speaker this afternoon or this evening is uh, Professor Simon Wilcock. Now he comes with great credentials, as those of you would have seen in the newsletter, but uh, the biggest credential he has is that some of our support group leaders at a forum here at um, Karingai Council heard Simon and they said to Pam and I that he's a must. So Simon, this is your opportunity. Simon is Professor and Head in the Discipline of General Practice at the Central Clinical School located <coughs> at Balmain and he's the Associate Dean Postgraduate Medical Education and Training, University of Sydney. We uh, welcome you Simon. Thank you very much David. Um, it's always nice, I mean one of the things that's nice about being a GP is that you work within your community all of the time and I think that's one of the things that attracts those of us that choose to do general practice. Um, my wife and I both grew up in this area, we both, um, I went to St Ives High School, my wife went to Karingai High School, we did our university um, while we were living in this area and apart from 10 years where we lived out of Sydney when we were practicing in Inverell and uh, northwestern New South Wales, we've always lived around this community. Um, and it's nice to be able to participate in, in functions and forums such as these. I was very impressed with the one that was run by um, Karingai Council last year and very impressed by the sorts of activities that you're doing on a regular basis with this, this particular support group. Um, just a, a little story about communities and, and the fact that we all belong to them and uh, uh, while you might think sometimes we live in big anonymous cities of four million uh, people, I had to interview at Sydney University um, this afternoon. Every year our first year medical students have to write a portfolio and they have to select a member of faculty to interview them. So I've been doing quite a few of those over the last few weeks. And I had a young Canadian girl and uh, they emailed me their portfolios and they have to reflect on some of their, their best learning experiences and some of their hardest learning experiences and also some of their most emotionally challenging uh, learning experiences that they've had in the first six months of the course. And in our course indeed they go into the hospitals one day a week even from, from day one or week one. And uh, I read this, uh, this young woman's um, portfolio and uh, when I met with her at three o'clock I said, um, so you're at, the, and bearing in mind, Sydney University, our clinical schools are essentially all of the hospitals from central Sydney and northern Sydney and western Sydney right out to Nepean and Hornsby and down to Prince Alfred. So we, we have a lot of hospitals and a lot of the population of Sydney um, that, uh, that, that are taught within those hospitals. Uh, and I said to this young girl, so uh, you're a student at the Adventist Clinical School, are you? And she said, yes, how did you know that? And I said, because the patient that you wrote about in your most uh, moving um, experience is a patient I diagnosed. I recognised the story, even though she didn't put the, the name there. And it was a young woman who I'd seen just after Christmas and one of those awful scenarios where, you know, a young woman with two little children, including one who was still only eight months old, came in, um, you know, thinking one thing, um, wondering, in fact, if she might be pregnant again which she was quite excited about and within 48 hours we had to tell her that she actually had a terrible diagnosis of a terrible tumour that she's probably not going to survive. And again uh, the fact that you know this, this in, in four million people in Sydney um, we could connect over one, uh, one patient like that just reflects to me what, how nice it is about working in communities because uh, it's, it's important that we do feel connected and that we've got um, communities around us to support us all the time. Because I'm a GP and because I work with people like Phil Catalaris, who's a specialist in urology, he's the guru in things like prostate cancer and while I'm happy for you to ask me some questions about prostate cancer later on, um, I'm not going to speak specifically about prostate cancer today. What I'm going to do or tonight, what I'm going to do is focus more on um, health aspects for men and particularly men like me who are in the sort of the, the more senior part of our lives and careers and, and what are the good things, what are the things we shouldn't ignore and basically look at a strategy for taking care of basics. Every now and then I have a patient comes in and says, I say, how are you? And they say, they're fine. Well, what can I do for you? Just check me for everything. You know, take blood tests for everything. I say, look, if I test you for everything possible, you won't have any blood left. You know, we actually have to work on the things that might, you know, commonly happen. And as we'll see in a moment, you know, prostate diseases are one of those things that can be quite common. So that's what we're going to do today. I apologise to the ladies in the audience, but as the custodians of the health often of the men in the audience, I hope you'll, use, you'll, you'll be a resource and, and, and uh, either confirm or deny some of the propositions that I'm going to put up there um, this evening. I understand their role. <laughs> so long as we understand our role, David. <laughs> 
So what we're going to do over the next 20 minutes is look at four specific issues, what I call closing the gap, and we're not talking in this instance about the, the difference between the health of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians, which is really important. We're talking about the gap in the health outcomes for men and women in our communities. A little bit about what sort of diseases do men suffer from in our communities and are they different um, to the diseases that women suffer from, so the burden of disease. A little bit around the literature of engagement strategies and one of the things we started to realise um, in a whole range of areas of medicine is that actually men and women think differently. Now this is probably not a surprise to any of you in the audience but it's uh, academic doctors sort of hadn't worked this out until relatively recently. So for instance when we've done programs around grief or, or, or dealing with cancer or something like that, the group that have been studied have either often been only one gender and not surprisingly when they try to use those sorts of strategies on the other gender they don't always work. So we'll look a little bit on you know, what are some of the things that have been identified in recent years as to barriers for engagement uh, for men in, in healthcare. And Remember, I'm not just speaking to you, but you all have sons and grandsons and, and other men in your lives as well, uh, and hopefully can take this message out there. And then finally, we'll finish with a sort of strategy which I call taking care of basics. You know, what are the really basic important things? And if you look after these things, you know, you're probably looking after 95% of the significant risks to our health as we, as we get older. Because it's a nice small group, we'll have lots of time for questions at the end, but if I do say anything that doesn't make sense or needs clarification as we go along, just wave your arm and uh, we'll stop and, and clarify it then. So what do we know about the, the gap in health outcomes for men? Well, the good news is it's getting better. You can see that in 1986, and this is the life expectancy at birth, uh, for men in Australia. In 1986 there was a, a nearly seven year gap between men and women and by 2006, 20 years later, that gap had closed to only about five years. Um, we used to think that men were sort of genetically programmed to die before women, you know, there was something about testosterone that made you inherently unhealthy. But what we've realised increasingly is that both male and female hormones have inherent risks associated with them, but a lot of the um, uh, earlier morbidity and, and poorer health outcomes in men was associated with a lot of the lifestyle things that we did. We used to smoke more, we used to have more accidents, we didn't look after ourselves, we didn't go for regular health checkups, so often disease was diagnosed fairly late. And uh, what increasingly is being predicted is that as we get better at looking after ourselves as men in the community, that gap will close. It's really interesting that nowadays in 2006 we have one of the longest life expectancies in the world, um, both for men and women. Now, if you're up, getting up close to 78, don't get depressed. It doesn't mean that your time is nearly up. Remember that this is a life expectancy at birth. So if you've lived to be a, a healthy 75, you have a, a very reasonable life expectancy up into your mid and late 80s. And if you live to 85, that goes up to around 90. So we have an actuary here, David can explain this better than I can, but uh, you know the fact that we've already um, survived childhood illnesses and, and the sorts of accidents that young males have mean that you know the life expectancy for anyone in this room um, normally and not taking into account any other health conditions you may have would actually be significantly more than that. But what we want to do is close that gap even further. If we look at what are the leading causes of death in men in Australia, um, and this was data from 2007, we can see that the good old vascular diseases, so heart disease and stroke and things like that, are right up there. And we know that the risk factors for vascular disease are things like smoking, high cholesterol, being overweight, not exercising enough, being diabetic. Uh, and having high blood pressure. So when we try to prevent vascular disease, what we do is try to manage each of those risk factors. And I'm sure you've all been heard of those, both in public education campaigns and in visits to health professionals. Um, down here in number four, uh, chronic lower respiratory disease. So things like chronic bronchitis and emphysema. What's really pleasing, and in the 30 years since I've graduated, um, the incidence of chronic lung diseases is declining in the community quite significantly. And we know that there are far fewer people smoking and smoking long time, long, long term, and also exposure to sort of occupational dusts and things like that is much better in the workplace than it used to be. However, when you take those things out, the other group there are significantly cancers. Uh, it's still trachea and lung cancer and prostate cancer right up there is the fifth commonest cause of death in men. Now this, common is, this, this column says where the same rate is in women and obviously not many women die of prostate cancer, very, very few in fact, um, so we substitute breast cancer there. 
Um, interestingly, for dementia and Alzheimer's disease, while it's only the sixth commonest cause of death in men, it's the third commonest cause of death in women, and that probably reflects that five years of extra life that women have, more women are going, going to get that. But it's really important in terms of the work that you do, not just in prostate cancer, but in cancer prevention generally, to try to get those incidences down. This is the one I always find sad, suicide. Men suicide more than women. You can see that women sort of don't, don't rate in that, that top 10. And again, um, engaging men and getting men to report um, risk factors for suicide and depression early on is one of the big strategies. And you talked about Beyond Blue, um, which speaks to that. Um, just looking at this graph, this is the death rates from cardiovascular disease and from cancer in Australia uh, between 2001 and 2007. And we can see we've actually had some spectacular results in terms of the, the, the numbers of people who are dying from cardiovascular disease, so heart disease and stroke. And this reflects that good risk factor management. I won't ask how many of you are on a statin, something like Lipitor, to keep your cholesterol down, but many in the community are. But I'm sure you've all been counselled and hopefully most of you are, are, are not smoking if you ever did and you're looking after your weight and you're getting regular exercise and if your blood pressure was up, you're, you're, you're having that control through medication. What's pleasing to see is even though cancer is a harder, it's, it's, a, it's a, a multifactorial condition and there's no single cure for cancer, it's also pleasing to see that survival rates or death rates from cancer are falling significantly um, during that time as well. And remember the population is getting on average older, so you would expect that if nothing else had changed, the death rates would actually be going up. So it's very pleasing to see that those death rates are going down. So we're heading in the right direction, but we can do better. So what are the male problems across the lifespan? So I'm very briefly going to talk about what happens to the young guys and then focus on, on us. So from 0 to 14, the kids, um, the main sorts of things that we see, and we're not talking about fatal diseases, but injuries, you know, little boys and little girls to an extent are, are boisterous and active so they can injure themselves. We increasingly see diagnoses of things like behavioural disorders, so uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. But the good news is in this generation is that we, don't, we no longer or very rarely see children dying of infectious diseases and those sorts of things, the sorts of things that before 1950 were quite common. And, and a tragedy like the one that's been in the paper where an eight-year-old boy dying of appendicitis when he shouldn't have um, is in the paper because it's so rare and so uncommon and while it was a true tragedy and shouldn't have happened, fortunately, you know, we don't lose young people generally to those sorts of conditions now. Then the young men, and I know I'm in that age group now, my sons are 29 and 26, and we all talk about, you know, that sigh of relief when your sons hit 25 and hopefully get a little bit more sense. We talk about that frontal lobe, the part of the brain that does the executive function of thinking, sort of maturing the, the nerve cells start to connect, often uh, in the mid-20s for, for, for men, and they, they take fewer risks. But up until that age, there's all sorts of uh, road accidents. Uh, suicide again, and we'll say a little bit more about How's, what messages society gives to men generally and young men specifically in a moment. Um, drug and alcohol, both experimentation and overuse. And of course, um, being sexually active, there's exposure to uh, sexual health problems which can ultimately uh, lead to severe disease as well. This is the sort of the missing link group, and I'm not going to focus particularly on them tonight, but when we talk about engagement, this is the group we try to get to. In general practice, these guys sort of go underground. You know, we did, they stop having accidents, uh, they, they get married, they get a mortgage, and they just plow on, you know, and many of us can, are either in that phase or can remember those days where you just put your head down and looked after everybody else and did every, everything you needed to be, but you never went to the doctor for your general, you know, your annual checkup. Your wife might have, and the kids went when they were sick, but we, we, this is sort of the, the group that we lose. And the important thing is that that's when we can actually influence some of those lifestyle factors like weight and cholesterol and blood pressure and activity uh, and other risky behaviours. Um, so we have to focus on that group. And then of course as people get older, uh, with the, the, the classic diseases that I put up there, cardiovascular diseases and cancer. So how are men different in terms of their health care? Anybody want to postulate? You know, a, a difference between men and women, how they approach their health care? Well, I've already sort of alluded to a few things, but any thoughts? Yep. Well, this is the one I also like to say that uh, men don't look after their bodies as well as they look after their cars. You can see our, our, uh, our guy there, how happy he is with his car. And yet if I asked him what his arteries were like, he'd probably look at me blankly. But his car is beautifully polished. And in fact, I often use this as an engagement strategy for men uh, if I get an opportunity to talk to them about a health. I'll say to them, do you have a car? And most guys do. Or do you drive? 
and they say, yeah, and they say, um, do you get it serviced? And they look at you like you're mad and say, of course I do. You know, you don't wait for the, the engine to fall out on the freeway before you think, oh, I must get the car serviced, do you? You say, well, why don't you do the same with your body? You know, why do you wait for something dramatic to happen when you're 55 or 60 without getting your body checked out regularly? And, uh, and I find as an engagement strategy that often works. Um, you don't have to be sick um, to, to actually focus on that. And in fact, it's worth investing in that regular checkup um, if it means that down the track, you know, the, the, sh the body and the chassis lasts for longer. Um, the other thing we've realised, as I said, is that the consultation, the traditional and classical consultation modes we have uh, for women and for children are not necessarily the ones that are appropriate for men. Now, I'm being hugely genderist here, but when you think of a consultation with women, I think of this sort of tea party consultation. People sit and they talk and they engage and they interact and we talk about personal things and, um, and it, it's quite appropriate. It's, it's easy to share important information. Now, when most men come into my practice, if I sit there and look eye to eye like this and say, and how are you feeling, Dave, you know, they actually get quite uncomfortable. Not all of them, but often they do. And when, you know, if they've already had health problems, they, that, that's not a problem. But uh, I realise that in many cases we have the sort of men's shed consultation, how men communicate. Now, if any of you can remember your sons, you know, the, your daughter's generally out the back, and I said it was, you know, grossly genderous. There are obviously crossovers both ways. But your daughters used to talk to each other and get on the phone and, 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 and their friends and things like that. The boys, if you ever watch boys, and as I said, mine in their 20s now, you know, my two boys and their best mate from around the corner, they used to sit along in a line, you know, with the consoles for the PlayStation there, and this conversation would just go up and down the line and it might take three hours with one comment every 10 minutes. But if you sat and listened, there was really important stuff coming out there. But if you'd said to them, now you boys, how are you coping with school? Have you, have you talked to each other about how it's going? They would have gone, oh, you know, Dad, no, don't even go there. So we have to find ways of engaging men in talking about their health in a way that they feel comfortable with. And often it's about focusing on, on not things like feelings and symptoms early on. It's about how do I, how do I, how do I keep the body, the, the, the car healthy at the moment and what practical things can I do. So talking a little bit about some of the literature on, on uh, barriers to engagement, for, particularly for what I call the invisible men, those guys sort of from 25 to 55 who we often don't see. And this was an article from the Australian Family Physician uh, in 2009 where a guy had actually looked at the literature on that. Um, one of the first things he found is that we stereotype men's attitudes to their health and basically say, well, they're hopeless anyway. You know, men don't do it right. They're hopeless. They don't, you know, they, they, they ignore it. So we're already setting up a, a, a sort of a negative paradigm within which we, we encounter men's health. And you think about that. We do it to men a lot in the community. You read lots of stories about pea plate drivers having accidents and young men, you know, being wild and footballers, you know, misbehaving. And yes, that's all news and perhaps it's newsworthy, but we don't, co we don't correspond have lots of good stories about what men do as well. And it's not surprising that young men and also middle-aged men at times can feel quite alienated in our communities and not surprising that they won't speak about things that are perhaps private and personal to them. Um, I think this is a really good one and for us as older men in the community it's, it's, we have to initiate young men into good health behaviours. We actually have to spend time explaining to, to, to young men um, that it is important to have health checks and, and, and uh, what, what, what's safe in terms of drinking and, and even sexual behaviour, um, uh, driving, taking risks, those sorts of things. And you know, many of you in the room have been fathers and have had those sorts of conversations with your, with your sons and perhaps grandsons. Interestingly, you, you often find with young men, they don't want to have that discussion with their father, but they'll have it with their mate's father or someone like that. And that's part of what's useful in being a community again. Um, that young friend of my two sons, he used to talk to me about all sorts of things and his, my sons used to talk to his dad who was their soccer coach. Uh, and, but we have to create an environment where people are happy uh, to talk about their health. Um, there's a shortage of men's programs and workers in community health, in, including Indigenous health. In other words, there's lots of programs for kids and there's quite a few programs for women, but not a lot of programs, and this is where it becomes relevant to things like prostate cancer, necessarily for men. I'm, um, tomorrow morning, one of my hats is that I, um, I chair the, general the National General Practice Training Program. Um, we have a $200 million a year budget to distribute around Australia to do GP training, and I have my meeting with Nicola Roxon, the health minister, tomorrow afternoon in Canada. 
Canberra. I meet with her twice a year. So if you've got any messages you want me to take to Nicola, tell me, tell me after this because uh, I can get, get a word in her ear. And again, I've already referred to this, this sort of marginalisation of boys and men by an education system that fails those not suited to conventional educational models. A lot of boys are not good classroom learners, and any of you who have been teachers, I'm sure, can, can back that up. And we have to find ways of sometimes engaging boys and young men in ways that they, they feel good about themselves, and they can become uh, contributing members of society. Many of these guys who are considered troublemakers and can't concentrate at 15, by the time they're 25 or so, have knuckled down to something and are really proving themselves and we often see them at university as well but nobody would have predicted that often when they're 15 and the girls mature faster not just physically but but cognitively as well so that article goes on to say that again we assume that men are, are not interested in, in in staying healthy that they, they have this disinterest in prevention and that's not true but we have to engage them differently um, we don't have a system that provides health services in the sort of way that men feel comfortable with, as I've already said. Um, this one, really important practical, you know, as I said, men have spent a lot of that working life out there working and, you know, trying to look after everybody else. And uh, if a practice is only open from nine till five, it can be quite difficult to get in to see uh, the doctor that you want to see. Uh, this one I really love, waiting room discomfort syndrome. Some of you guys might address to this. Character, uh, relate to this, characterised by a dislike of excessive waiting in women's magazines <laughs> and a fear of a health system with which you're unfamiliar. And of course, cost. And again, I think men are used to sacrificing. Everybody else's needs will often come before their own. And if there's a bit of a tightness in the family budget, well, the thing that you're going you're gonna to cut is probably your own needs. Like, you know, it's, it'll be the, the dad that won't buy his own new shoes before everybody else gets their new shoes. He often won't get his own health issues addressed as well. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to give you a, a simple paradigm around how you can address this, something that's easy to remember. We're all busy and we all get bombarded with information. What I like about this one is that it's quite easy to remember because of the acronym, which is basically about your physical health, your emotional or affective health, your social or community health, your cognitive or intellectual health, and your cosmic or spiritual health. And I do a lot of doctor's health work, so I have an interest in the health of other doctors and go, have been to a number of international com um, conferences on doctor's health. And I came across this particular um, acronym from the New Jersey Medical Association Physician Health Program. About seven years later, I ran into somebody from that program, was telling them how much I liked their program, and they said they'd never heard of it. But seeing as I sort of got it from them, I still feel I should attribute it every time I use it. So going through very quickly, and you know, we, can, we could spend ho a whole day on you know, taking care of basics. Again, it is basic. It's nothing that you haven't heard before, but it's just reminding you that things are important. Exercise, rest, recreation, and having boundaries and balance in your lives. Eating well, and we'll talk a bit more about eating well later on. I often, when I speak to groups of GPs, say to them, how many of you prescribe regular exercise for your patients? And of course, they all put their hands up. So the next question I ask them is, so how many of you exercise at the level that you prescribe for your patients? And that's when many of them look sheepish and look at the floor. The good news is 10 years ago it might have been 15 or 20 percent. These days it's more likely to be 50 percent. And that message getting out there, hey, to, to doctors, hey, you're not superhuman. You don't have different genes to your patients. You have the same risk factors they do. So if they have to sleep and eat and, and, and rest, you have to sleep and eat well and rest as well. But it goes to the men in our community as well. Um, the boundaries and balance one is, is an interesting one because we live in a society that values um, giving. Um, how many of you want to be known as selfish? None of us. Nobody wants to be up this end. So we assume that we have to be down here, which is being selfless. In other words, you just give and give and give and give, and, and, you know, and if you've got anything left to give, you give that away as well. Um, I do a lot of work looking at burnout, um, not just in medical practitioners, but in the community generally. And the problem with being selfless is that you burn out. If you're giving from a well of well-being, your own em emotional, spiritual, physical well-being, and you're giving that out to other people and your well dries out because you haven't got anything, any spring replenishing that well, you get burnt out and that's not a good thing. When I say to doctors, and there have been some good studies, a burnt out doctor actually doesn't provide good care to their patients. Where you want to be is here in the middle. You want to be generous. Uh, and if you're constantly replenishing and recharging your own supplies of largesse, then you can afford to be here and be generous. You're not selfish, but you're not burnt out either. And in our lives generally, this is where we need to be. 
If I asked um, a group of men, um, you know, how many of you exercise, how many of you know that you should exercise every day? You'd probably all put your hands out. And then I could do the same exercise. So how many of you do exercise every day? And probably not everybody would put their hand up. And the reasons would be, but I'm busy, I had to do this, I had to help my son move house, I'm using all the excuses I might. You now I spent the weekend in Townsville at meetings like I did, so there's lots of reasons. If you don't actually roster it in, if you don't consider it's important, if you don't make time for it, of course you won't prioritise it. You'll, you'll, you'll be down here, you'll be being selfless and doing lots of things for other people, but ultimately it may adversely affect your health. Eating well, um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not rocket science and, and you'll hear lots of information about what you should be um, uh, eating. Uh, and that can become very confusing, particularly in the days of the internet, and I'll show you a couple of slides in a moment which, which illustrate that. But the basic message is keep eating from the five food groups, so keep eating a good balanced diet. And I'll talk a little bit about what do we know. For an, for, for an older age group, these are the sorts of questions you may you know, be interested in terms of diet. Do we have much evidence around either cancer prevention or dementia prevention? Now this is from a website um, that talks about uh, what sort of things you should, you should eat and why they're good for you. And it makes all sorts of claims, you know, apples are great for your joints, they block diarrhoea, chili peppers are good for a sore throat, combat cancer, they boost your immune system. This is actually an actual website if you went looking for it. Uh, avocados control blood pressure, I didn't know that, but uh, apparently they do according to this website. Strawberries boost your memory. Now, if you actually go to this website, this is the guy who has the website up, but he says, I'm grateful to Runaway, whoever that is, for sending me this wonderful list of health-promoting foods in alphabetical order. And that's the problem with the, with the internet. You have to actually know how to look at the, the reliability of the information that's out there. So what do we need to know about other than you know, the five basic healthy, the basic food types? Well, in terms of preventing common cancers, uh, including prostate cancer and bowel cancer, uh, the common ones that we know about, to a lesser extent lung cancer, the main thing to do to prevent lung cancer is to not smoke. Plenty of fruits and vegetables, lots of the antioxidants and the things that boost your immune system. The current cancer theory is that in many organ systems you develop little mutations that could lead to cancer many times during your life. And the body usually corrects those mutations and they don't become cancerous. And, and one of the ways of, of helping that to happen is to have all of the, the vitamins, minerals, antioxidants that you get in fresh fruits and vegetables. And try to keep them fresh as well. Um, the more preservatives that are used, the, the less the uh, effect of those particular um, substances. Limit your red meat. Doesn't mean don't eat red meat. I'm, I'm um, not a vegan, um, but we know that red meat, and particularly the animal fats associated with red meat, so the really tasty, you know, part on the chop and things like that, uh, are, can be carcinogenic, and it's dose related. I still like my fatty tail of a chop now and then, but I don't have it every night. Uh, and you know, l l small amounts of lean meat in a stir fry fine but probably limit the, the sort of a diet that our parents may have grown up on where it was sort of lots of meat and a couple of vegetables we can probably turn that around have more vegetables and less and lean red meat increase your physical activity. It's not just about weight. We know that um, being overweight or obese increases the risk of a whole lot of cancers, but independently being physically active reduces your risk of a whole range of cancers as well. So combining those two things obviously help each other. If you increase your physical activity, it helps with your healthy weight. My mother, who's 80, ran the city to surf with me last weekend. And that was good, you know, but she's been a runner. It wasn't something that she'd you know, never done before, but she hadn't run it for some years, really enjoyed it. Unfortunately, while we were celebrating that, my father-in-law ran over my mother-in-law's foot and she ended up here in the sand with a broken hip. So it was sort of one of those days where we had some good news and bad news, but she's done really well. Um, and limiting alcohol. And again, I like a glass of red wine, particularly on the weekends. Uh, that doesn't mean no alcohol, but we know that significant amounts of alcohol can increase your risk of various cancers as well. In fact, there's something on, I think on the front page of the Herald about um, risk factors for cancer. Uh, only today, some of you will have read. Uh, and one of the points they made is that while people blame stress, the public often blames stress, the reality is it's these basic things that you can limit. Now a little bit about stress, there, it is true that stress is bad and we'll see a slide on that at the moment. Stress is bad for immune system and so it can increase all sorts of problems but it's sometimes harder to control stress in your lives. So th these are the things that you, you can have fairly reasonable control over so long as you factor them in, roster them in, things like regular exercise. 
a little bit of evidence for supplements. <coughs> many people or many companies make a lot of money about selling us, out of selling us supplements. Folic acid, which is really one of the B vitamins, selenium supplements, vitamin E, which is a, an antioxidant. Some possible evidence, although it's not hard evidence. But most of these things you should be getting from fresh fruit and vegetables and foodstuffs anyway. So if you're eating plenty of fresh fruit and vegetables, you shouldn't necessarily need to spend lots of, money on on lots of money on supplements. And some of these things, currently, there's no hard evidence for in terms of cancer prevention. So for soy-based foods, the beta-carotene supplements, and this was one I think that was quite popular as a, as a prostate cancer prevention um, some years ago, vitamin C supplements. OK, what about preventing dementia or cognitive decline? Um, first thing to say is that there are many causes. So there's not a universal or not likely to be a universal magic bullet. We do know that the omega-3 fatty acids, that are the one that occur particularly in deep sea fish, the same ones that are good for our cholesterol and things, do seem to reduce the, the, the rate of, of onset of dementia. Now whether that works through vascular causes, um, in other words, um, vascular disease, high blood pressure, mini strokes and things can cause dementia, or whether they have an independent action, we're not, pro we're not too sure at the moment, they probably have an independent action as well as preventing vascular disease. And again, all of these antioxidants and anti-inflammatories, vitamins A, E, C, this is where beta-carotene does seem to have a role and uh, fruits such as blueberries with the polyphenols. But again, most of these things, if you're eating plenty of fresh fruit and vegetables, you should be getting those things in your diet anyway. And they're being studied with some promising results. Interestingly, and you all would have heard that you know, we're, going, we're on the edge of a dementia epidemic because our population, more people are, 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 we have more older people in our population, there's going to be this epidemic. That's being slightly compensated for, or, and hopefully will be significantly compensated for, but the, that the incidence of dementia seems to be being pushed out. In other words, um, the number of people who would suffer from dementia at age 80 now compared to 20 years ago is probably lower. And that's probably multifactorial. It probably relates to the same things that make our general health help better at 80, but also the fact that we're aware that keeping cognitively active, keeping our brains engaged, being active in the community seem to have a preventive effect as well. So it's not all doom and gloom. So I've already talked about diet. Um, certainly managing blood pressure is really important. If you treat a thousand patients for five years uh, who have high blood pressure, and high blood pressure is very common in the community, you can prevent 20 new cases of dementia. And again, that activity and exercise, not just physical exercise, but mental exercise as well, doing your crosswords and your Sudokus and things like that. Just to finish off on the, the other aspects of health, that's physical health. This is your emotional health. Um, and that's a, all about managing your mood. Now, if you find yourself constantly grumpy, you know, the, the, the traditional grumpy old man, and you know, our partners will tell us, and I certainly have days like that, that's not good for you. We know that's not good for your health. Um, one of the things we know that's good for you is being emotionally intelligent. Now you're all familiar with IQ, which is where you do the test and it shows how bright you are. But the thing that predicts more for whether you're happy and successful in life is EQ or emotional intelligence. And that's basically being aware of the sorts of things that stress you. Don't put yourselves in situations that you know you're going to be really stressful. If you're like me and you're a time Nazi and you hate being late, make sure you go leave yourself plenty of time to get places. Other people you know don't mind if they get there late. Me, it stresses. So make sure I always allow plenty of time. Manage your emotions positively. It's not worth having, you know, get, get getting upset because somebody pinches your car park in the shopping centre. There are lots of things that are important to get upset about. That's probably not one of them. But you have to sort of re-channel those feelings when they uh, when they pop up. Um, being empathic, understanding that other people have have their issues and needs as well, um, and delaying your own gratification, but not indefinitely. And I have Peter Costello up there because he's the poster child of delayed gratification in Australia. He sort of never, never quite got what he was waiting for, did he? I was going to change this slide to Julia Gillard, but then she blew that argument out of the water. She stopped delaying her gratification. We and a hell of a lot of less stress if we had those guys back at the moment. <laughs> 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 yeah. And dealing with negative emotions. In other words, you know, the, there are things that should rightly stress us, and we'll see what the Germans got stressed about in a moment. But there are lots of things that we get stressed about that we probably shouldn't get stressed about. So you know, be stressed about the things that are really important and learn to react differently to the other things. Um, what we know is that a little bit of stress in a well-supported environment actually improves our performance. But if the stress is too great or the, or the support is too low, 
then performance falls off. So I use this slide with medical students to say, look, it's actually good that we set you an exam because it makes you learn. But so long as you're prepared, uh, that's going to be fine. If you haven't done any study or we make the test too hard, there's not enough support there, your performance is going to fall off. Now this is just a little bit of fun study that the Germans, I'm fairly Teutonic in nature myself, so I love the way the Germans did this study. And this is a sports quiz for the, for the men in the room. The Germans published a study in the New England Journal of Medicine a few uh, years ago that showed that viewing a stressful soccer match more than doubles the risk of, a, of an acute cardiovascular event, meaning a heart attack or some other major heart problem, uh, by more than three times in men, but even in women, nearly doubled the risk of, uh, of heart attack. And this, they did this study during the World Cup in Germany in 2006. Did anybody go to that? I didn't, but my sons did. They said it was fantastic, beautifully organised, as only the, you would imagine the Germans did. What they did is they looked at all the presentations to their emergency departments between May and July for 2003, 2005 and 2006, which was the year of the, uh, the, the World Cup. And each of those numbers represents a game in which Germany was playing in the World Cup. So this, they feel, proves conclusively that stress is actually bad for you, but sometimes you can't always manage the stress. Now, this is the sports quiz question for the sports aficionados in the group. Why were the Germans not particularly stressed about game three? Sorry? No, 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 I don't think they played this the last time they played Australia. Wasn't that a horrible match, 4-0? No, 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 that, that, that was all the South African one. This is the one before in Germany. It was the third game in the group match and they were already through. They'd won their first two games so there was no stress, they were already through. Okay, and then came the sudden death games and of course it gives a whole new meaning to the term sudden death when you see this graph, doesn't it? <laughs> Germans clutching their chests everywhere. Um, so game four, they won their first uh, knockout game. Can anybody remember what happened in game five or, or can you imagine what must have happened in game five? Penalty shootout with Ar Argentina, which they just narrowly won. Game six is where they were knocked out by Italy, who were the final winners. Very stressful again. And if anybody tries to convince you that playing off for third is just as good as being first or second, being in the grand final, the Germans obviously didn't think so. They didn't get in the least bit excited about being in the playoff for third. They got a little bit excited about watching Italy, the eventual winners. Okay, nearly finished now, but um, the S in BASIC is for social health. And this is where it's all about. What do we mean by social health? Social health is really about being part of a community, having a system or a network around you so that when things go pear-shaped in your lives, you've actually got people who can support you. Now, for my father-in-law, my parents-in-law live, in the, my parents -in -law live in the retirement village in, in this area. Um, you know, when his wife was suddenly in hospital and, you know, he was feeling terrible about it because he'd contributed to that and while his children live in the area, there were lots of people in the area that were dropping by, giving him meals, um, taking him places, making sure that he was okay. Many people think, oh, I don't need a community, it's just a hassle having all those other people around me. But when things go bad in your life, that's when it's really important to have that community around you. And if you have a community, you can actually cope with bad things happening in your life. You can try different things and if they don't work out, that's okay. There are other people that will say, never mind, you know, let me help. Um, you can, you can um, give and receive feedback. In other words, if you're not sure about whether you should make an investment or something like that, you can talk to people who'll trust. You'll say, if you're going to invest in that, you're nuts. And, you know, it, trust it as, as solid advice. And supporting each other and experiencing love and intimacy. So that's what social health is all about. And really important at every phase of life, but certainly significantly important uh, as we get older as well, having that community of people around us. Um, this guy Peck talks about a community being, you know, 200 people that you know, don't have to know everything about them, but who know you and know you in context and, and, and you know, you, you could contribute to something. And in a sense, this is a community, this particular support group is a community who can act and support somebody else in the group if suddenly something, something bad happened to them. I is for your cognitive health. And this is really important as we get older. I talk to a lot of my doctor colleagues. Now, 35 years ago when we were in medical school, we were, we, you know, we were baby boomers. And you know how obnoxious baby boomers were. We knew everything. We didn't listen to our parents, you know. We, 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 uh, we, we, the, the world was our oyster. And what amazes me is what control freaks baby boomers and my baby boomer colleagues have grown into. They need to control everything now. And when I talk to my doctor colleagues my age, and we talk about young doctors today, 
And they tend to say things like, and this is of course Scrooge um, from A Christmas Carol, but to re-paraphrase what Scrooge says about Christmas, the young doctors today, they only care about lifestyle. As if that's a bad thing, as if that balance in your life is important. And I you know, hear that from many people. I work a lot with young people, not just young doctors, and they're actually really good people. They're just as committed as we are, but they've grown up in an environment where they have to consider different things. And if you think of somebody in their 20s today, they know they're always going to be employed. You know, We know unemployment's not going to be an issue for their generation because there's not enough of them. However, they may never be able to afford to own a house because we baby boomers own all the, the, the real estate and keep the prices up. So it's not surprising that if they're in a job that they're not happy or feel that they're being respected and look after, they may move on. Now we often interpret that as a lack of commitment, but if you see it in the context of what their lives are about, it actually helps you to reevaluate uh, and, and understand that you know people don't really change from one generation to another. Uh, and if people are behaving in a certain way, we have to understand. Now you know we had a, we, we got a little uh, um, discussion around politics started a moment ago, and I'm not going to take that further. But politics is that classic example where you see things happen and how many of us over our lives have, have seen someone come in and think, oh, they seem to be a reasonable person. And then five or six years down the track, you think, no, no, they're doing things that are actually not, not uh, reasonable. And that's all about re-evaluating your worldview. It doesn't mean you have to change your beliefs, but you actually have to re-look re at them in, the, in, the, in different contexts at time. And if you do that, you don't end up being a grumpy old man or a grumpy old woman. You end up being engaged with your children and your grandchildren and, and, and with the community. And that's why that cognitive health is really important. Keep up with all of the current events, the reading, hobbies and things like that. And you know, we have to sometimes deal with our feelings of entitlement. You know, Why don't they respect us? Why don't they look after us? And finally, spiritual health. Um, for some people, that's religion. But it's broader than, than religion. It's this personal sense of meaning and purpose, this sort of sense of you know, why I'm here and what has this all been worth. And of course, as we get older, that's a really important thing. If you look at the history of Western philosophy over about 3,000 years, there's this constant battle between the sort of the scientists who want to understand why and how everything works, and then the other side who say, well, but there must be a meaning and purpose to all of this. Now, I'm a scientist, I'm a doctor, I was trained as a scientist, but I also realised that if these people have been arguing over this for 3,000 years, it means that you actually have to use both sides of your brain. If you just act as a scientist and look for the logic all the time and don't step back and think about what's right, what is the meaning and purpose of all of this, then you're probably only thinking with one side of your brain. What, I, what they talk about is the ability to experience awe, wonder and surprise. Now if you ask your average 10 year old, when was the last moment they had a wow moment? Most of them will have had three or four as they were walking to school each morning if their mums let them walk to school rather than driving them there. If you ask people my age, when was their last wow moment, some of them go, oh, oh, uh, 2019, uh, you know. <laughs> And you know, we get bogged down in, in the day-to-day -day existence and all that stuff we talked about earlier, doing the right thing for other people, but sometimes forgetting that, you know, to stand back and say, why am I all doing this? Why is it all important? So that when end of life comes, and it does come for all of us eventually, you can sit back and think, you know, it's been good and it's meant something. So just to finish off, when I talk to the young doctors and young people, it's all about those things as we all get older. Sometimes it becomes even a little bit more basic than that. They're the things that we, we want to focus on. But seriously, it still is about those domains of health. And uh, Stephanie Dowrick, who some of you would know, a well-known sort of local author, she's actually a New Zealander but I think lives in Australia, a book she published a few years ago called Choosing Happiness, um, talked about this I think is a lovely quote for people in Australia, most of whom are hard working and, and, you know, and uh, sacrifice for other people and a life crowded with the legitimate needs of other people and that defines many of our lives. Time for yourself can seem the most elusive gift possible but it may also be the most essential in terms of maintaining your own health so you can keep on helping other people. So thank you very much. Very well done Simon. Now, um, questions? Graham's over there, so just put your hand up if you want to ask a question. We'll come to you with a mic. Thanks for your talk. Um, diet, the one thing that you didn't mention, which I, uh, I guess I've seen mentioned a lot, is nuts. Yep, nuts fall into the, the legumes part of the five basic food groups. 
Um, nuts are fine. The problem with nuts is that they're not one thing. So peanuts are actually um, different to other nuts like um, peanuts are a legume where, where, the, where, where things like Brazil nuts and almonds are, are sort of true nuts. Um, they're good. You have to be careful with nuts because they can flare up diverticulitis and some of you may have been told about that because you don't always fully um, digest nuts because they're hard. But in terms of the protein and the, and the other um, uh, substances that are in them, yeah, they're a really good food source. Just have to chew them really well. That's the, that's the message. But they fall into those two, uh, those five basic food groups, but actually across a couple of them. And the other interesting thing with nuts is allergy. I mean, you know, when we were young, nobody had peanut allergy, and now, you know, one of the things that really irritates me when I fly somewhere is I don't get peanuts anymore because, you know, the, the, the nut allergy is so much more common. We really don't understand that why something like peanut allergy seems to have become so much more common. There's probably a couple of reasons. One is that so they call it the hygiene hypothesis, and some of you may have heard of that, that these days we are so anxious with our small children about them being exposed to allergens or foreign substances that we actually protect them for too long and their immune systems overreact when they first encounter them. And there's probably some truth in that. Um, the other is that we're probably overly vigilant and we probably overdiagnose it as well, and there's probably some truth in that. We have sometimes uh, a, a, a play group full of six or seven mothers who all carry EpiPens, the adrenaline sort of anaphylaxis pens in their handbags all the time because their, their kids supposedly all have a life-threatening allergy. Now, I can't believe the commonness, that the, the, the incidence is that common. So it's a combination of anxiety and probably that hygiene hypothesis. The good thing too about allergies like nut allergy, and if you have children and grandchildren who have been diagnosed, increasingly we see the evidence that they often grow out of it as well. So um, you know, encourage them to keep getting tested because it can be very restrictive. You see kids on diets with all these things excluded, and often by the time they're five or six, they can eat most of those things again. It's um, it's quite interesting in in PCFA. We we find uh, it's an uphill battle in rural and remote areas. If, you, um, if we think that men in metropolitan Australia are difficult to get to go to the doctor and to do all the things you talk about, uh, we have the devil's own job of convincing them in the rural parts of Australia and the remote parts in particular. Yep. It's quite an issue, isn't it? Oh, absolutely, and having been a GP in Inverell in the 1980s, uh, I could certainly relate to that. Um, I think there's a couple of things you can do to address that. One of the things that's changing hugely is um, uh, information technology. We can now do telehealth. So we can now, I mean, most people in most parts of Australia can actually access the internet even if they can't access a health practitioner. What we now have to do is find ways of using that technology that men feel comfortable with. And again, there's still that flip side of saying let's find them, now that we can give them the technology to talk to a doctor, um, they may still try to find other ways of avoid it because of all of the reasons that we put up there. So we have to engage them, we have to make them understand what are the important things. Depression in rural communities among men is huge huge and particularly during the years of, of drought that we had rates of suicide and depression were horrendously high. So not just physical health issues but all of those issues uh, have to be addressed. Um, what we have to not, rem not forget is that often men in metropolitan communities who have access to all of those services still don't use them. One trick up our sleeve is we're um, using the Country Women's Association and, and organisations like that because yep. the women are the health managers and uh, yep. It's very helpful. And you'll often see uh, at a field day, for instance, you know, if you say to the blokes, well, why don't you go to the CWA meeting to you know, learn about your health? But many of them are going to go to the field days to look at the new tractors. And you'll often find that the, that the, the stand will be set up. There'll be one of the local health organisations will have a stand set up. Now, it won't say, come and have your prostate test there, because you know that the guys are going to you know, walk well around that. But it'll have some sort of engaging message there to get them in. And then, as I said, you don't sit there and you say, now, have you thought about having your prostate <laughs> tested um, when you're trying to engage a man? You make sure that the messages are there in a way that people can access them. You can have conversations it might be talking about the weather um, you know for, for 20 minutes or so and then leading into it and what that's that's one of the things that 
the traditional sort of 15 minute consultation paradigm doesn't suit when you're trying to engage someone like that. He's talking about not just things like their prostate but erectile dysfunction and chest pain and those sorts of things. People, particularly men, have to be comfortable before they, they're going to talk to, to th about things like that. So we're starting to look at different techniques but we haven't got them all perfect yet by any means. Simon, just following on from that um, and relating it to the rural um, sector, um, I've heard of a, I'm aware of, and I've heard of a program in some of the rural areas called Pit Stop, which I think is run in conjunction with the men's sheds and yep. the field days and that. Yep. I mean, would you care to comment on that? I don't know a lot about the detail, but I do know of it, and uh, it fits in beautifully with the car analogy, doesn't it? You know, okay, come and come and get your check up and your grease and oil change and things like that, and you know, we won't talk too much about feelings until you get in here, but you know, then you can sort of say so. How are you coping with the drought? You know, must play, but you know, must bugger up your your your, your finances or whatever, and and see where that takes you, and and, and have those consultation, those those conversations. And people have to be comfortable with with where they're going, but it does allow you. It's a different way of sitting down, as we teach our medical students, and sort of saying, right now, I'm going to ask you if you're depressed, you know, and which just doesn't work. My voice is so loud. Usually, I'm a bit scared using these things. Um, our kids grew up with peanut butter. None of them seemed to develop any allergies at all. We didn't give them peanuts at that stage. But can allergies develop with children that have only eaten peanut butter? Um, no, I mean, most of the, allerg the peanut allergies we see diagnosed are in very young children. But I agree, the same thing. What was really traumatic, unfortunately, my eldest son is 29, because some schools now send home notes saying, please don't send anything with peanut you know, to school. Now, my, my son, when he was at infant school and primary school, lived on peanut butter sandwiches. He wouldn't have eaten anything else. The poor kid would have had to go hungry. Uh, we would have had to find something else to send with him. But yes, as I said, we don't really understand why that... Um, that incidence has gone up. Certainly, there's a lot of anxiety about there, and I think it gets overdiagnosed. And to be fair, I think the health profession sometimes contributes to that. There's an industry in allergy testing uh, and making and, and and making these diagnoses. And if you do a skin prick test on somebody and you get a mildly positive result, that doesn't mean that you've got a life-threatening allergy to that substance. And of course, in our day, we didn't do skin prick testing on every child for a whole range of things. Um, but we have we have to, I think, take responsibility. Responsibility. Fortunately, the debate's starting to shift back the other way as we realise too many kids are being diagnosed not just with peanut allergy but with a whole lot of restrictive sort of dietary conditions which ne aren't necessarily things you want them to have to live with all their life. In uh, part of the talks that I give to awareness being, it often comes to me that they find difficulty getting a GP who will do the dreaded DRE. Right. Uh, is there some effort being made now to address that as a problem and to assure that the the GP at least offers it if he doesn't yep. positively insist that it be done. Yep. Look, I think that there's two parts to that question. The first is finding a GP that you connect with. And it's a bit like anything else in life. You know, the first time you try a new, and I'll try with the ladies here, a new hairdresser or someone like that, doesn't mean it's going to be the person that after you've been there once or twice that you think, I'm going to keep going back there. You test people out. And you have to say that to people. Look, if you have a, you know, uh, an experience with a GP or a specialist for that matter that you don't feel like you connect with, don't meet, don't, don't, use that as an excuse for never going to the doctor again. Find a different GP. So you have to find somebody that you connect with and, and that you're comfortable with. One of the things I love about general practice is that in my current practice in Hornsby, I've been there for 21 years. So my, many of my patients have known me for that time. So we know each other really well. So that when something happens to them, uh, we have a, you know, it's not this awkward, you know, well, I'm Simon and you know, I'm going to do this to you. Um, we actually, you know, we know each other. The issue of doing a digital rectal examination or the DRE, it shouldn't be difficult. Certainly all of our students are taught to do it and these days we actually teach them on models before we get them to practice on patients, so that's good. Like plastic models, yes. I hate to add. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, 
uh, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm surprised. I, I think it's bad medicine. It doesn't mean you have to do a D DRE on every patient, but it, a lot of um, prostate screening, and, and we were talking about this, David and I, earlier these days. As you know, there's quite a controversy out there in the community about you know should we be screening for prostate cancer, um, and there are certain situations where you would do a blood test. There are certain situations where you would do a digital rectal examination. The majority you would do both because they increase the sensitivity of each other. Um, it's always hard for general practitioners when our expert groups can't disagree and there's a good, they can't agree. There's a good example of that going on with prostate cancer testing at the moment. The College of Pathologists have recently come out, as you're probably aware, with a statement saying they think everybody should be tested from the age of 50 or 45. Um, whereas the College of GPs, my college, has said, well, based on all of the sort of um, meta-analyses of the literature, there's no evidence that testing everybody um, improves the overall outcomes for the population. Now, that might be very true, but for the person who you pick up, um, the, 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 my chief executive officer for the, the company that I work with in Canberra, and he's my age, um, he had a routine PSA last year, it was high, he had prostate cancer, he's had the treatment. Now for someone like him, whose father had died of prostate cancer, but at a much later age, you know, if he hadn't been screened, if he'd been talked out of screening, and he probably wouldn't have because of his family history, you know, that would have had a disastrous um, um, effect. And then you know, the third factor in all of that is the medical legal stuff. I mean it's all very well for the people to say well on a population health basis you shouldn't be doing it or offering it to everybody but you don't want to be the doctor who's missed the, the, the one case. So what we ask for in general practice is for our experts to come up with some sort of consensus. But prostate cancer as we saw, while people talk of it as a benign disease, it's the fifth commonest cause of death in Australia. Uh, even though most of those deaths occur in an elderly population, it's still a cause of death and it's preventable. So um, you know, I don't, I don't screen according to my college guidelines. I'm much more robust in my screening and I certainly talk about it with every patient. It's, it's very good to hear. <laughs> applause, applause. <laughs> so, uh, it's, a really, um, it's a really big issue and from a PCFA point of view, we're getting, as we were talking, um, much closer together with the Urological Society and the Australasian College of Pathologists and the radiation oncologists, and hopefully not too far away, is more of common ground yep. so that we can talk to GPs um, on a reasonable basis. Yep. And I only practice part time because of my, clinically part time because of my other, other hats. But I would have at least half a dozen patients who are men in their 50s and early 60s who've all had elevated PSAs and who we've all assessed and some of them, some of them have turned out to be benign, some of them have turned out to be cancer, some of them have been actively treated, some of them are on watchful waiting. But at least we know what's going on with all of them. And I certainly wouldn't be comfortable as a GP, you know, not knowing what was going on. It's refreshing to hear this. Very good. Graeme, you're doing better than me now. Thanks. Just on, on that question, um, I just want to ask, what is the drawback from the professional side of the actual screening? Why is there negativity to the screening? Yeah, look, uh, a lot of that negativity comes from the public health people who advise general practice and Simon Chapman, and many of you would know Simon Chapman. Now Simon Chapman's the sort of anti-smoking guru. He's in the faculty with me at Sydney University. I know him well. And he's got to be on be under his bonnet about prostate cancer screening, as you know. Yeah. Now I don't see the logic in it. Um, Again, he comes from the very public health perspective where you're talking about populations and communities. So you can say, you know, if 10,000 people out there, if we screened all the, 10,000 men, if we screened them all for, for, with their PSAs at age such and such, you know, I don't believe that we would have better, better outcomes uh, 20 years from now in terms of the overall health of that group. I have two responses to that. Firstly, it doesn't pick up the individual who, yes, who may have had a very bad uh, outcome from it. But also, I can, I'm old enough to remember when we were having the same debates around uh, breast cancer screening, screening mammography. Uh, when I was in Inverell in the 1980s, we were having the same debates of, oh, does it really make a difference? Should we really be screening uh, women for breast cancer? Unequivocally, now, 30 years later, we say absolutely we should because we have um, scope for early intervention. Now, we know that one of the problems with screening is you get false positives and you can over-investigate. And I think we do have to look at all of those issues. But that should be about developing better techniques and less invasive techniques for investigating those false positives. It shouldn't be about, let's just not do the test. Yeah. 
And uh, these days, um, you've got to say that active surveillance is, is a reasonable treatment. Option, Absolutely. Which it, it probably wasn't, although they used to call it watchful waiting a few mm. years ago. It probably wasn't. Uh, well, it wasn't as popular. No. A and now, um, with the early screening and the greater awareness, active surveillance for people with low-grade prostate cancer is a very viable treatment option. Yeah. But even, I mean, one of the things that a lot of people agree on is that you don't screen older men. You know, I think 78 is the one cutoff that one group used, but certainly over 80, you know, don't screen them because it won't improve the outcomes. I have a number of patients who we've diagnosed their prostate cancers in their 80s, and these are guys who are now in their 90s and with active treatment have had much more healthy functional years than they would have if we just ignored them because um, an aggressive prostate cancer in your 80s causes kidney failure and all sorts of problems like that. So again, I think it's something that, that we will revisit. And I'm quite glad to see the urologists and the pathologists sort of coming out more actively because I think a lot of it's been done in the context of you know, average life expectancy of 75 and those sorts of things. We're not average, you know, we, we're individuals. Another, Pam? You want to? OK, I have another one. As we talked about screening, and it's really refreshing to hear you say what you've said and the way you've said it, um, one of the things that um, we've been exposed to in recent times is talking to GPs with urologists around um, Sydney mainly about the rehabilitation side of prostate cancer treatments, yep. um, particularly incontinence and particularly erectile dysfunction. And it's amazing when we go and talk to the GPs, they honestly don't know that much about it, but they're very willing to learn and they realise that they've got to be more proactive in talking yep. to their patients about it. What's your view? Uh, look, I agree with you, David. I think we've come out of an era where we were told that particularly things like radical prostatectomy, we were taught that everybody was going to get erectile dysfunction and that you, know, you just had to live with that and that um, everybody was going to get a degree of incontinence which you could, you could work with and hopefully people would get a good result. I think, that, as you say, these days where there have been some intense intervention programs, people are getting much better results and we have better drugs, we have better treatments. I was saying to David earlier, my wife is the chairperson of the National Continence and Women's Health Foundation for the Australian Physio Association. So she has a real interest in this area, not just in women, but in, in, in men as well, and may be an interesting person to, to come and talk another time. Um, but yeah, I, I, again, where the changes come, they come usually from the cutting edge, from the specialists who work all the time in a, in a narrow area. And what we have to do is get those messages out to the, to the GPs who are working all of the time but in a broad area uh, as quickly as possible. Yeah. And as effectively as yes. possible. Yes. And that's one of our challenges at PCFA, to do that and work with you. Yep. And again, it comes down to the nature of the consultation. I know that if I don't ask about those things, many people won't tell me about them because of the, the nature of being a man. That's right. And especially the guy. Yeah. Yeah. As they say in the classic, all overdone. Um, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, let's put our hands together and uh, thank you. Very much.